Welcome to um, the public hearing, this public hearing, which is uh, part of the consultation on the uh, guide and the regulation on the exercise of options and discretions in union law. Thanks, everybody, for coming here to Frankfurt, to the ECB, on this uh, cold winter day. And um, we're here today to listen to your views and to your questions uh, that you might have on these two documents that uh, are meant to harmonize the supervision of banks in the euro area. Um, just a few housekeeping remarks before you start. Most importantly, in the day and age that everybody runs around with something like this, please mute it. Um, then, uh, on the hearing itself, um, the focus of this hearing, uh, oh, in the focus of this hearing, are the two documents that I just mentioned. So uh, any other supervisory uh, issues you might want to raise through the appropriate channels. And this goes without saying, probably, uh, we cannot talk about monetary policy, although we are in this great building of the ECB. Um, last not least, um, this hearing is webcast. So we are live. And the webcast can be watched again on our website afterwards. So just let you know. Um, on the panel here, um, we have um, those who were um, mainly responsible for drafting the two documents um, that you saw. And I just want to introduce now the podium. Um, then you will hear a few uh, introductory remarks. And then we go into the question and answering session and um, uh, see what is on your mind on these matters. So um, the podium is led by um, Ignazio Angeloni, member of the uh, ECB supervisory board. Uh, to my right, um, Chiara Ciglioli, she's director general legal services um, of the ECB. To her right, Eleni Kopevidu, she's head of the uh, supervisory law division. On the other side, on the uh, far right, um, Giuseppe Siani, he is Deputy Director General of DGMS4. And to his left, Thomas Jorgensen, um, he is Head of the um, Supervisory Policy Division. So without further ado, um, let's start. Ignacio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rolf, and good morning, everybody. And thanks a lot for uh, being here once again. I, I think that uh, this public hearing, which comes close to the end of the public consultation, the public consultation will close on the 16th. Today is the 11th, so we still have a few days. But towards the end, it's common practice to have a public hearing to receive, in addition to the written comments, uh, also questions and comments de visu, uh, and to be able to interact uh, more lively with uh, the stakeholders of, uh, of this policy package. I have to say that, um, of course, we are here to, for you. We are here to help you today. But in some sense, you are also here for us, because the comments and the remarks that you make are very valuable, very useful for us. And I, I would say particularly in a matter like this one, this particular policy package, which is vast because it covers a large part of uh, European banking legislation, is very complex. Uh, there are lots of details. Uh, we must make sure that we got it right, not all, only in a high level sense, but also for what it relates to the specific situation of specific banks in specific countries. So, it's important that we get all the details right. And of course, this makes it impossible to do it purely top down. We need to receive feedback from the stakeholder for people that uh, are working in specific situations and are capable of appreciating the impact of what we do in their own specific situation. So this means that, uh, as Rolf said, that we will have, of course, questions and answer after our short presentation. but. Uh, we will try to answer on the spot uh, most of the questions that you ask, but there could be situations in which you ask us something that we have to look into a little bit more in detail, in which case we will, of course, uh, look into it after the public, after the, the, the public hearing today, 
And we encourage, in those cases particularly, to submit questions in writing so that we can be more precise in answering uh, your questions in an exhaustive way. Let me say briefly what this is about and how we went forward um, in this particular case. So this is a comprehensive package of policy decisions that has been prepared by the supervisory board of the ECB. And it relates to the treatment that the SSM will make of the so-called options and discretions in European banking legislation. There are many provisions in European banking legislation, be it CRR, CRD, or related delegated acts, which are discretionary or optional in nature, meaning that uh, in the case of options, that there are different possibilities in the hands of the, comp of the competent authority or the member state, different possibilities on how to apply a certain provision, or in case of discretions, there is a possibility to apply or not to apply a certain provision. These are elements of flexibility that have been there in European legislation for a long time, and they uh, were uh, uh, inserted in the legislation for a variety of reasons. First of all, to take into account uh, different conditions of domestic banking markets and uh, the business model of banks in different countries, and also uh, to cater for different supervisory approaches, different supervisory styles at the time in which supervision was still conducted in different countries by different and independent supervisory authorities. So all these provisions were put there at the time in which the SSM was not even envisaged. Okay, we were in a, in, 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 in a, in a, in a situation in which different authorities were applying the legislation and of course they needed this flexibility. So it is only natural that uh, once the SSM becomes the competent authority for banking supervision in the SSM area, we uh, look at this provision and we decide how to exercise them or, uh, in a consistent way, in a way that makes sense, taking into account the diversity of the banking population, but also making sure that we are consistent and we practice a level playing field, which is a key element of the mandate that we have. So this is exactly the purpose of uh, what we have been doing. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the main goal, let me stress that, uh, is the uh, fact of having a consistent approach in our supervisory actions to establish high supervisory <coughs> standards. This is our mandate. We have to promote high supervisory standards and level playing field. And uh, uh, in that way, uh, we uh, are very much at the heart of the mandate of the single supervisory mechanism. So we started earlier this year <coughs> looking at uh, uh, the legislation and trying to identify what these optional or discretionary provisions were. It's not very easy because they are formulated in different ways. Uh, the wordings are different. Uh, and yet, they imply a certain amount of discretion for uh, the competent authority of the member state in different ways and to different degrees, depending on uh, different provisions. So we identified uh, a certain number, large number of this provision, over 150 at the beginning of this year, according to certain criteria. Some of them are entrusted to member states, meaning legisla national legislation, some others competent authority. Of course, we focus on the ones that are entrusted to the competent authority, because this is what we are. We are not a member state, we are a competent authority. Uh, this restricted the number of options discretionary provisions to 122, which are the ones that we focus uh, in uh, our discussion today. Then, next step, we analyzed each of them in great detail, uh, thinking what the uh, right way to apply them would be. We conducted a quantitative impact study to assess the quantitative impact of uh, our possible choices on the balance sheet of the banks. Different alternatives can have different impact in order to compare to the extent possible, you know, and based on the information that we had. 
Uh, we have uh, uh, systematically uh, liaised with the European Banking Authority and the Commission, you know, the EBA issues uh, technical standards for uh, banking policies so that's very much connected with the work on ONDs and the Commission is of course the guardian of the treaty and the legislation so it's important to liaise with them uh, as well. And at the end of all this work, we um, delivered a proposal in July to the supervisory board, and the supervisory board has approved this. Uh, then the summer months were devoted to converting all this into technical legal language. And here come the two documents that you have in front of you today. One document is a regulation. The other document is a guide. What is the difference between the two? The regulation uh, contains general rules that are binding directly on all banks. We're talking about significant banks, so the banks that are supervised directly by the ECB. And so regulation sets the rules and the banks can uh, apply them directly without coming to us and asking any permission or waiver or anything like that. Then there are a number of others, actually the majority of provisions, which are uh, more case by case. And they are uh, by and large contained in the guide. So the guide is really a guidance to our supervisory teams on how to apply provisions when they receive requests for waivers or permissions that they have to be judged on a case by case basis. The guide is, is not a comp compulsory regulation on banks is more a guide to our JSTs, to our joint supervisory teams. Uh, we are consulting on both, although the legal requirement would be to consult only, only on the regulation, but for transparency and for maintaining a good dialogue with the industry, we consult on both. And, uh, and this is what uh, uh, we are going to discuss today, both, uh, both of these documents. So by doing that, I think we are uh, <coughs> achieving, we are making a major step towards more harmonious banking rules and more harmonious uh, policies by the single supervisor. We uh, are being prudent in the sense that uh, many of the provisions that uh, you have seen precisely go in the direction of improving the quality of capital, for example, in many cases, when we accelerate the transition towards uh, the phased in, fully phased in, uh, or in any case to make sure that our supervisory action is as prudent as possible, but at the same time, and that's important, fostering banking integration. Particularly in some of the provisions that we will discuss, uh, we wanted to facilitate uh, a more efficient uh, internal management for banking groups, particularly banking groups that operate across borders in the SSM area. That's, of course, a major goal that the SSM itself wants to achieve, to foster banking integration in the area. At the same time, we have to do it in a prudent way because, to some extent, we are venturing into unexplored territory. And so we want to do it gradually and cum grano salis. Uh, last, but I would say not least, important also, we took an eye uh, systematically uh, to Basel consistency. The Basel is the international standards that we contribute to shape as Europe, and uh, it's important that, unless there are very strong reasons against, that we try to be as uh, consistent with the Basel standards as we possibly can. I think I would stop here. Uh, I'm not going into details because we will discuss the details in the, um, in the discussion, uh, but I think Chiara Zilioli perhaps can uh, say something on the legal underpinnings of all this. Certainly. Thank you, Ignazio. I will then uh, focus my introductory uh, part on uh, what is the legal basis for the ECB to uh, prepare and adopt the measures that have been now consulted with the public, and why does the ECB do it? On, on which um, article of the treaty we can only act when we have a power conferred to us upon by the treaty or by secondary European legislation. The fact that the ECB is the competent authority for all the participating member states um, uh, 
is stated in Article 9.1 of the SSM regulation. So the task of the ECB is, as the competent authority, to apply the material rules that are adopted uh, by the EU. In addition, the material rules adopted by the member states implementing the rules of the EU, and of course also the standards that are adopted at the European level. Now, when doing that, the ECB is exercising these powers of supervisor, powers of uh, supervisory competent authority. Now, as Ignazio mentioned, the rules that we have to apply include those options and discretion. What are legally options and discretion? They are the space for discretion that the legislator decided to leave to the supervisor to exercise in order to better adapt the action to the reality. And uh, as Ignazio mentioned, there are uh, certain differences among them. The drafting is very different um, throughout the legislation, but in fact, we can categorize those differences. First of all, according to who has the power to exercise this discretion, and there are options and discretions that are assigned to member states, others that are assigned to the competent authorities, and a third smaller group that is assigned to either the member state or the competent authority. Now, <clears throat> the second type of categorization is um, where they come from, and they come, we look at the two legal, base, legal acts uh, that are fundamental for us, the regulation and the directives of the CRR and the CRD4. And maybe the third type of category we could look at is whether these options and discretion refer to the exercise of discretionality towards an individual bank, or perhaps where there is a space to further um, define uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the rules that apply to not only one, but to a number of banks. If you take these three issues, uh, what we have done in the regulation is to tackle, well, we, what we have done in general is only to take care of the options and discretions that the competent authorities are assigned. So we don't deal, of course, with options and discretions that are the competence of member states. And we also decided not to deal with those where there would be a choice between member states and competent authority. So we only take what is actually given by the legislator to the competent authority, therefore to the ECB. The second point is, uh, in the regulation, we deal with options and discretions that are um, contained in the regulation itself. Uh, while uh, it is more in the guide where we look at the discretion left by the directive. Why? Because these are more of an individualized nature, while the ones in the regulation are more of a uh, more general nature. So if you take this, uh, this approach, you will see that the ECB has really taken a lot of care after the analysis that Ignazio mentioned to first identify all the existing option and discretion, to exercise those that are key for the supervisor and that, are, that have priority for the exercise of our uh, tasks. Um, another point perhaps to be made very clear is that, as uh, also was briefly mentioned already, what we exercise are the options and discretions for the uh, significant banks, the ones that we supervise directly. We, of course, have also supervisory tasks that are more general and encompass to a different and lighter degree uh, the less significant banks. I'll come to it later. But what we do here is, in the regulation in particular, to address the significant banks. Um, so just to conclude, what we exercise are supervisory powers. There is absolutely no interference with regulation. We act only within the framework that is constituted and created by European law, implementing national law and standards adopted by the EBA and uh, Commission competent authorities. If we come to the point of the different approach for significant institution and less significant institution. Um, as I said, the regulation applies directly to the significant institution. Um, at the same time, the ECB has a responsibility in accordance with Article 6 of the um, uh, SSM regulation uh, for the effective and consistent functioning of the whole SSM and also for the consistency of supervisory outcomes. Now, of course, the exercise of an option and discretion has an impact on the, is, uh, on the rules that will be applied and has an impact on the behavior of the 
banks. So the fact that um, there are different approaches might create problems or perhaps might not create problems. Uh, different approaches between the approach for significant institution and for less significant institution. Now, this is for uh, later in the sense that, again, the ECB decided to approach as a priority the significant institution. Later on, it will be considered in which way it would be perhaps advisable in some cases to uh, apply similar rule. And in this case, the ECB will recommend to the National Competent Authority uh, to take a similar approach to avoid a disruption or a, a lack of level playing field. Or perhaps in some cases it might be very well justified to have a different regime because the least, a less significant institution might require a different type of exercise of an option. So this will be tackled later and it is a second step only after we have cutter for the significant institution. I would like maybe to mention that this is not only the ECB perspective, this approach has been discussed at the supervisory board and some national competent authority have already expressed an interest to accelerate this work because it's very, very important to coordinate and to be aware of how to tackle these options and discretion also for the less significant institution. The last point I would touch upon is the nature of the two documents. Ignazio already uh, briefly mentioned it, but just to summarize, uh, the regulation for us uh, is, of course, and, uh, uh, the important legal instrument because it binds directly the banks. Uh, it is um, uh, European legislation. Uh, it also uh, uh, is very, very specific, creates obligation for the supervised entity. This is why our procedure or the legislator has uh, foreseen that we need to consult because of the very strong and uh, in-depth impact that it has. Uh, of course, re uh, regulation needs to be uh, applied and taking into account all the general principles of European law, so proportionality, equal treatment, legitimate expectations, and so on. So this is, of course, there. Uh, but of course, it is very, uh, a very defined step in the direction of um, further uh, harmonizing the approach in um, uh, the supervision for the significant institution. It will enter into force 20 days after publication, and that from that moment, it will be law. Now, the guide is a, a different um, document. It is um, not binding directly the banks. It is rather um, self-binding the e ECB. It is an indication to uh, the outside world of the criteria that will be followed when taking individualized decisions. So um, it is an indication to also uh, help uh, planning help uh, the expectation of the banks when they when they make their request. Um, at the same time, it is not um, impossible for the ECB to uh, take a slightly different approach if uh, it is necessary. So in this case, however, it will be necessary to accurately motiv uh, motivate why uh, a certain criterion is applied but in a different way or is applied um, only partially. Uh, Again, with the respect of the principles uh, of proportionality, equal treatment, and legitimate expectation. So I think the guide is nevertheless extremely important for the banks uh, to be aware of uh, the approach of uh, the ECB as supervisor. Um, at the same time, it is different, and this is why we were even not uh, obliged, as Ignazio mentioned, to consult, but we've decided to do it nevertheless because we consider the two documents are um, closely linked. I'll stop here if um, this is enough. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. So um, we're now opening the floor to your questions. And um, the idea is um, to give everybody um, the same opportunities to ask questions. So therefore, I wanted to ask you to um, stick um, at first uh, to the two questions that uh, are closest to your heart, that are most important to you. Uh, and then we move on to the next participant who, uh, who has uh, uh, questions. And, um, we can do as many rounds as necessary in the time allotted so that uh, every question can be covered. Um, we have microphones in the room, so please wait till um, you get one. Otherwise, the people, particularly on the webcast, won't understand you. And it would be nice if you would um, state your name and your organization so that everybody knows who is, uh, is questioning. So uh, who wants to be uh, the first to ask a question?
Good morning. Sergio Lugaresi from the Italian Banking uh, Association. As European <clears throat> banking industry, we, has, we have um, stressed the three <coughs> principles um, that um, have been uh, uh, addressed uh, um, by the proposals of the ECB. Uh, also, we have still some comments to make. These principles are first the level playing field. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we note that in this uh, respect, um, the proposal um, maintain uh, the uh, stricter for transitional uh, provisions, maintain stricter rules uh, uh, introduced by national laws. So in this respect, there will be no uh, a full harmonization of rules, but uh, for, uh, also for the transitional uh, period, uh, stricter rules will remain. We had suggested a different approach that can combine uh, legitimate expectations and uh, maximum harmonization, that is to harmonize at the uh, uh, most favorable level. The second principle uh, was uh, the free flow of capital and liquidity. And here also there, there are um, important improvements in the proposals. Nonetheless, we know that there are still um, strict requirements uh, on liquidity waivers, for example. And we, uh, we see the 70% uh, limit on high liquidity high quality liquid assets as a very pessimistic uh, approach that assumed that only 25% of the banking union has been achieved. Uh, whereas uh, I think we can assume that much more progress has been done. We, we may still be in a, in a transition period, but 75% uh, for three years uh, seems to us very strict, as well as the documentation required for the, um, for the uh, waivers are be very strict, costly, and may create disincentives to the request. As uh, the last point, legitimate expectations, these have been uh, uh, clear, clearly addressed, and uh, Chiara and others have uh, mentioned it, this morning, and we, we, we welcome this. We noted that, for, uh, nonetheless, for some provisions, this expectation has, are not fully respected. This, the, it is the case of the rise of deductible percentages for DTA depending on future profitability that has increased immediately in the proposal. It is the case of the shortening of the period of non-deductible um, insurance holdings. And here uh, we understand that the legitimate expectation has to do with concrete events and choices. Uh, we know that, uh, that the capital holdings are uh, different from other, uh, from other, um, other uh, elements of the capital definitions as uh, uh, they are anticipated by, by, by uh, the markets. And if you plan, to, uh, to sell or buy holdings, this, this has to, um, to rely on, uh, on, on a stable period of time where provisions uh, uh, are taken. So we, we have other comments, but I think the, the main one are this one, and maybe I can uh, intervene uh, later in the discussion. Thank you. Actually, Many questions, not only, which I'm grateful for, but we had a limit of two questions. <laughs> Doesn't matter. No, first of all, uh, let me say, take the opportunity to say we appreciate a lot the um, support, but also the stimulus of the European Banking Association to, <coughs> to which you belong as an association, the EBF. Uh, they have already opened uh, an office in Frankfurt recently, and I think they will be very valuable partners for the ECB, for, uh, particularly for the supervisory work uh, going forward. Uh, you uh, made three uh, points, or three questions. One, the first relates to the, uh, how to treat the transitionals and how to treat the situations in which national, auto national authorities have already decided for their own separate independent treatment 
uh, of those transitionals. We've discussed that at length, uh, pros and cons. Uh, one is full uh, level playing field homogeneity. On the other hand is prudence. And, uh, and both these um, criteria are important in our, uh, in our balance uh, approach. Um, we have to consider that this is a transitional problem anyway. Uh, so in 2018, the problem will disappear. So the question in this short transitional period, whether to admit that the more prudent, if it is more prudent, national treatment could continue to exist. And on balance, considering that this is transitional, we thought that the criterion of prudence would, uh, uh, would uh, uh, be preserved, would have to be preserved. In, in many cases, and I talk to banks and people in the market, et cetera, most people are now beginning to focus on fully phased in situations as opposed to the transitional situation. And so I think that uh, in terms of the impact that this has uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, relatively, is relatively limited. But this was the reason why we've chosen this approach. Your second point, very important, the free flow of capital and liquidity uh, the openness, the integration of the banking market. This is important for large banks particularly. Uh, as far as capital is concerned, uh, our reading of the CRR is that cross-border waivers of capitals are not possible. So we are talking here about cross-border liquidity waivers. Uh, there again, openness versus prudence, uh, we have noted that there are certain subsidiaries in the SSM territory, subsidiaries of banks that are established in other countries within the same SSM areas, that are systemic in nature. Uh, either because of their size or because of the type of business, etc., etc. And so we... Um, those, uh, by the way, those subs that are systemic, if one focuses on the size criterion, the 30 billion, are about 20 uh, in over, I think, a total number of subs in the SSM area, which is thousands, it measures in a thousand. So we're talking about the tiny number of subs, uh, of course, very important quantitatively, for which one has to be prudent. That's the key point. And, uh, we thought that uh, uh, eliminating altogether, potentially, through waivers, <coughs> liquidity requirement for those systemic sub subs, uh, all of a sudden, would not fulfill the criteria of prudence. And we would, better, we would be better off doing it this in a gradual way. So how we did it is we, um, the, the, the LCR, which came in, in uh, force in October, as you know, is itself phasing in, and there is a period of phasing in from 60% to 100%. Uh, and so the obligation at the beginning, the obligation for the sub will be 75% or there of their fully phased in LCR requirement, 75%, or if it is lower, uh, uh, the uh, requirement that is applied on the parent, because it wouldn't make sense to ask to the sub to have a more stringent criterion than the parent. So we have these two parameters that one has to weigh, and we indicate in the guide, as you may see, that uh, we want to open uh, this further uh, in the future. We already indicate that in uh, 2018 we want to go down to 50%. Of course, that will be another decision by the supervisory board, but that's the direction. We want to make it more and more open, but with prudence. Concerning uh, the um, adjustment for the phasing out, in this case, of the DTAs, and the uh, shortening of the uh, deduction for insurance holdings, again, simplicity versus openness of the systems versus prudence. Okay, this is again the, the, the criterion that, we've, that we have chosen. And we uh, thought that uh, we, should, we should favor a also transition as rapid as possible to a simpler system. Uh, and this is what the, there, is a, there is a standard phasing out uh, a schedule in the Basel uh, provision, which goes on to 2018. So in the vast majority of cases, we have tried as much as possible to 
um, put ourselves in line with that phasing out. That's, I think, uh, the, the criterion that we have applied. I don't know if Giuseppe wants to add something on this. Maybe. Giuseppe is our, our man that bridges Basel with Europe. I mean, he's... Maybe one or two points, if I may. You also raised the issue of the documentation being too burdensome as part of your second, second quest. But I think that the starting point is always is the criteria that are set out in, in the CRR, right? So, and then there is one criterion that is very important, which is the, the need to ensure that there is no imped, legal impediment to the free movement of, of liquidity. Uh, so, in this respect, uh, we need to have uh, an update legal assessment uh, for, for two reasons. First, because the, the legal situation in different countries might be different, and also because the legal situation evolves over time. So, asking an updated legal opinion does not look so burdensome. Second uh, comment is that uh, most of the documentation that we ask should, in principle, already be available to the bank. For example, the corporate structure. So. I think that uh, it, overall, if you think of uh, the, the achievement also in terms of uh, supervision and the regulation that we try to, you know, to grant the waiver uh, to mobilize liquidity within the Eurozone, I think that uh, you know, if you assess the cost and the benefits, I think that uh, it's not really so, so burdensome from my perspective. On, on the third point, I, I couldn't agree more with, your, with what you said, that we try to converge to Basel again so in, a, in the transitional. So the, the general policy decision there was to try to converge again towards the five-year transitional period set out in Basel. Let me add um, that um, uh, this element of prudence in the treatment of liquidity allowed us, allowed us also to be relatively more open on the large exposure side. You, you may have seen that we admit the possibility of full waivers in the large exposures intra-group, uh, cross-border, uh, subject to waivers, of course, the criteria and the <coughs> condition, the, the specifications, etc. But there we have full opening. And, you know, I would, have be, I would have been a little bit less relaxed in doing that hadn't we had, you know, a relatively more prudent approach on the liquidity side. I uh, Chiara, on the legal side. Perhaps one, one brief uh, comment on the issue of legitimate expectation, just to avoid any misunderstanding. So legitimate expectation is a, a protected uh, concept, but also a limited one. So first of all, uh, one needs to uh, realize that we are dealing with uh, expert economic operators, and it cannot be that um, uh, the process of the introduction of the uh, single uh, banking union has been a gradual one, a relatively long one. It was clear since a couple of years that there will be a new supervisor, and it was understandable also to the banks that the new supervisor will have to make new assessment and exercise these options and discretions. Um, uh, the court has been very, very clear in stating that um, it was a similar uh, parallel situation, but it was talking about traders. But anyway, that, that it is impossible to claim to have a legitimate expectation that, that because there is a certain policy, that policy will not change. So um, clearly, we talk of legitimate expectation when there are certain conditions. It needs to be unconditional, consistent, and um, assurances by the authority that is competent uh, in a certain direction, so that people have planned and organized themselves, etc. Uh, we're not excluding at all that we might face some of these situations, but uh, this is different from saying um, there are legitimate expectations, therefore we expected you not to take a different approach or not to change uh, a certain uh, uh, direction that was previously set by a national competent authority. In particular, I would say in the content that we have today in the regulations, so in the more general uh, approaches, um, it is more probable that legitimate expectation would arise in relation to uh, an individual bank and therefore in the context of the guide. And then there will be certainly be taken into account. And maybe a last point, uh, the legislator also is aware of the legitimate expectation issue, and precisely all these transitions are there in order to take that into account. So one way of cutter for legitimate expectation is to allow people to phase in or phase out. So a lot of it is already done. Yeah? So um, just to try to give the right dimension to the issue of legitimate expectation, which is something we consider, we will consider, but also has a limited scope. 
Thank you very much. Can you help? Well, uh, good morning, Michel Bilger, Crédit Agricole. I'm coming back on, on the first point of Sergio, uh, on the transitional measures, um, because phased in ratios are very important <coughs> still, because, for example, they are the basis of the stress tests next year. They are also the basis of the TILAC calculations. They are basis of the SREP uh, decisions and requirements. So uh, I can understand the point of balance between uh, level playing field and uh, prudence. But uh, just one example, uh, the goodwill, deduction of goodwill. I, I still do not understand why it would be more prudent to deduct in France. 100% of the goodwill, whereas in Germany it's only uh, 60%. So my question is, uh, is this uh, still a possibility to, to change and to come back on uh, the, the reference to the national rules? In cases where the rules, the national rules are stricter than the harmonized rules you are proposing. Thank you. So it's really the, the first point, the first point that uh, Mr. Lugaresi raised. So the combination of stricter national rules versus the general rule that we now make it a little bit, uh, well, I'm taking from the lawyers the definition of legitimate expectation, meaning that there is a well-grounded reason for a market operator to expect based, for example, on statements or actions undertaken by the authorities that uh, uh, on which their expectation is grounded. This is what legitimate means. And in this case, there was a decision of the national authority. So I, I think that was a particularly strong ground for us to, uh, you know, to think that uh, we should respect those legitimate expectations. Plus, there is, of course, the sense of prudence. You know, uh, if uh, a particular treatment has been considered as appropriately prudent in a given national context, uh, and again, we are talking about the transitional situation, which is not long, uh, you know, we are moving into a uh, regime, why not keep it? You know, th that was, you know, I'm being very simple, but I'm, we are applying common sense here to some extent. That was the criterion that we, that we have followed. Yeah. Mr. Sutaski. Thank you. Uh, Martin Sutaski with the German Savings Banks Association. Um, I have uh, one procedural remark and one uh, uh, remark or question regarding the content of the uh, consultation. Uh, first, the, the procedural. Um, we, we have the impression and uh, we appreciate that very much that the ECB has um, put a lot of work into the preparation of the consultation. Um, as not least, it was uh, it were uh, 122 ONDs that are consulted right now, um, but at the same time we have the impression that um, even for an ECB consultation, um, relatively little time is allocated to the consultation itself. So we would certainly, with uh, with a view on a future consultation next year regarding ONDs uh, for for LSIs, we would certainly prefer and argue for uh, a longer consultation period of, say, two to three months. Um, now, the, the um, content uh, uh, question that I have relates to uh, Article 42 to CRR, uh, where the um, CRR obvious, obviously states that there uh, might be or may be an application of IFRS for uh, prudential purposes, um, even at um, institutions that account regarding uh, to or according to a national gap. 24, not 42, 24, okay. 24 to um, CRR, of course. So, um, and obviously uh, 24 um, only applies to, to groups uh, under the scope of prudential consolidation. Um, now the, the SSM regulation, um, as we are all aware, um, uh, very clearly states that there, um, 
due to the SSM, there might, may not be a change to the uh, accounting regime and that um, the, the ECB and the SSM may not, not require institutions to apply different accounting than uh, what is legally required, say, my, uh, the, the national gap versus the IFRS accounting. Um, the consultation states that there is an impact study uh, currently being uh, conducted regarding uh, this uh, uh, option in 2042 uh, CRR and um, I would just like to ask you to elaborate a little further on the impact study and on how the ECB is going to um, to deal with the uh, discrepancy between the uh, SSM regulation and uh, and this option. Thank you. On the procedure, you want to say something about the length? Uh, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your comment on the procedurals, and uh, uh, yeah, very much appreciated. Um, we will take this into account for future planning. On the second point, uh, be assured that we cannot and we will not change the accounting standards uh, as a result of this. Maybe one day the accounting standards will change, but will not be on this table that the accounting standards are changed. Having said that, uh, uh, Article 24.2 gives the option or the discretion, depending on the point of view, to the competent authority to apply for certain particular items of the balance sheet that are particularly relevant from a prudential purpose and for the purpose of comparability in order to put everybody on the same footing, IFRS in order to estimate the impact of that particular balance sheet item for the risks of the bank. This is, a, this is something that one can do, it's in the law, right? So this was discussed uh, intensely and uh, it was felt uh, by the supervisory board uh, that it would be useful, potentially important, to go and look a little bit more precisely uh, with some quantitative estimates what the actual impact of this would be in some specific relevant cases. So this is what the pilot, I would call it a pilot because it's not on all banks but on a small number of banks and at the same time also not only the impact in terms of the uh, prudence evaluation but also how difficult it is to do, you know, how complex it is for those banks that do not yet apply EFRS, uh, how complicated this would be to do it. This is what we are doing. So we have, we have uh, talked to, we have established a subgroup in our organization. This subgroup has uh, looked at a small number of banks and now we're in contact with them. We're trying to see if we can estimate some magnitude and make a pilot evaluation, a pilot impact study. This means that no decision has been made at all on this. We just want to see whatever the decision that will be made. It's, it's important, it's useful to know what the impact of this is. You know, and we have a strong legal backing here. So we will, I, I guess, if there are unsurmountable problems for some banks, we will scope them out. Uh, that's not, uh, what, what we uh, want to see if there are so specific instances in which this may become an important point in order for us to guide our, our decision later. And then the supervisory board in its wisdom will decide what to do on the basis of this information. May, may I just yes. add a, a very brief comment on the legal aspect? Um, you, you have correctly identified that there are different provisions, but they are of different nature. So the two provisions in the SSM are part of the recitals. The recitals function in a regulation is to explain the content of the text. They do not confer any rights or obligation. So it is an explanation that nothing in the text of the SSRM should be construed as changing anything of the existing law. Now, the article on which we base this is not change, it's actually existing in the existing law 24.2. So uh, it is an exception, perhaps, to the normal um, rules uh, and as such continues to apply. So this is how we make the liaison. Let me add that since, in fact, some of the complications in, in making this calculation, in fact, are coming from some German banks, uh, we would appreciate very much the support of your organization in help us understand what is feasible, what is not feasible, what is useful, what is not useful.
gentleman with the gray hair. Jürgen Hillen, Deutsche Börse Group. I have uh, three small questions, if you allow, uh, in order to understand uh, certain topics. First one is on the large exposures. Um, of course, with regards to Article 493, there is national discretion. There's national discretion, sorry for that. Um, there's national discretion in order to uh, allow the uh, choices of Article 402. So if a country does not apply the rules of 493, that is of course also a decision not to apply the options. So the question is how 493.3 and 402 come together and what may be still the basis for you to execute the options under 402. So there we see some open questions. The next one is on Article 12. In Article 12, uh, to A, exposures to ECB are named. However, the exposures will be to the national central banks and not to the ECB. So maybe there's need for clarification that you mean the national central banks of the euro system. Third item I have is on Article 13, which refers to Article 12 of the Delegated Regulation uh, related to the LCR. Here, the regulation referred to has two parts. One is giving the Competent Authority the right to determine the major indices. And the second one is giving a clear right to the institutions to choose the index itself if the National Competent Authority has not done so. What you're doing now is you just refer to the decision done by an authority, but I think you cannot exclude the right of the credit institution to choose its own index if the National Composite Authority has not done so, or contrary, you need to choose the index country by country within the SSM zone. Let me start with the first. I'm not sure that I will be able to provide full answer to all of them. And in, in, in a case of, of this, I would encourage you, if you have time in the coming days, to write it down and send it, because that will... Now, our interpretation of the interaction between 493 and 402 is slightly different. And here I, I call on my legal... So uh, if the... When the uh, option discretion can be exercised either by the member state or by the competent authority, and the member state has decided not to do so, our interpretation is that the competent authority is in charge. And so we fall into uh, the case in which the large exposure waiver is onto the competent authority. So it, I think this is slightly different from the way you described at the beginning. But I'm asking Chiara, who probably no, knows more. I, I think the, you, you reflected correctly our understanding. So it's not a decision of the member state not to do it. Is that the member state doesn't do it, doesn't which exercise. means yeah. it goes to the... the... The point is the member state may have decided explicitly not to apply, and the only choice not to apply is not to write it in the law. So how do you distinguish between the pure decision not to apply by just doing nothing with the decision to leave it to the discretion to the competent authority? How can you distinguish these two situations? We have Th that's the question where you need to find an answer for. That's, that's the only point. OK, we will look into this. Yeah. On, on the central bank, on the, we're talking about uh, European central banks, not uh, because there is also an issue of third country central bank, but that's not what you refer to. Uh, Giuseppe or, or Thomas, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I, th I think it's correct that we are talking about European uh, central banks here. Um, yes. Yeah. Then the last one. Uh, Can you help on the last one, uh, Thomas? Yeah, yeah I, I think we will need to look into this, uh, whether there is a right for the institution to choose that themselves. Uh, if this is the case, uh, we will need to, to look into this and we'll come back. Thanks. <laughs> Please, uh, I think that there are very good points. Uh, so if you can really help clarify uh, also in a written form, that would help. So we will look at that. Put the microphone just next to you. Hello, my name is Mariano Lasarte from KPMG Spain. Uh, my question is 
much easier than, than the previous ones, is uh, the, you have said, uh, Chiara, that it will enter into force 20 days later, and in the document it says that it will come out on March, so we really expect April to be fully applicable. Thank you. Um, as I said, will be 20 days after publication. We, we don't know the exact date yet, but in principle, uh, I think your expectation is correct. That's our uh, aim, yeah? But uh, it will always be 20 days after publication. So one day up or down uh, depends when the publication comes out. This is a, a general rule in new law to ensure that uh, everybody is aware before uh, it becomes bound by, by the rules of a regulation, the 20 days after publication, and this is what will happen. Hello, my name is Gerda Holzinger from Erste Group. I have a question regarding Article 4, where you mentioned that for the default definition you impose uh, 90 days past due for all exposures, for all portfolios, also for those where currently there's a different uh, 180 days past due definition. And we were wondering uh, how the ECB will sees the, the, the process of implementing such a change in terms if this means uh, a change in models, a material change in models, and the application, the validation uh, processes that need to be uh, implemented in the banks. Do you have any, any, any background information on that? Um, for, for this specific options, there are only a few member states that, that imposes uh, 180 days. It, it, it's a very limited number. So, so we have uh, analyzed this and come to the conclusion that, uh, that this is, 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 a, is, a, is, is, is not a major uh, increase and, and this is possible for, for the banks to, to, to do this. Well. You used it also in the comprehensive assessment, the yes, same criterion, right. if yes. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. We used it also, the same criterion we was used in the comprehensive assessment, so it's not new. Good morning, uh, Thomas Nicolas, BNP Paribas. I'd like to come back briefly on the large exposure exemptions uh, with uh, two questions. Uh, one is, uh, in substance, the um, criteria for granting the exemptions that are described in the appendix. Uh, one um, require the bank to have a, a credit risk framework for managing intracope exposure, which is, in, in a sense, similar to the framework it would have to for third party uh, exposures. And if you could elaborate on the underlying logic of that, because it's not very natural, I would say, for uh, within a group to consider uh, subsidiaries as third parties. And the second question is, there are situations like in Belgium where the exemption have been granted by competent authorities and not by uh, the member states in, in a law. And uh, we are, we're wondering what would uh, what those exemptions would become with this new rule. Maybe I can say a couple of words. Maybe you can integrate. I the like third parties may look excessive, but the groups have different internal organizations. Some of them are more centralized. Maybe yours is one case. Some others are much more of a federal structure, very independent. And uh, the rule has to cater in a prudent, prudent way for all the different situations. So that's why, you know, then uh, this is a guide. So the JST will look into it and will uh, uh, make the assessment on the basis of the criteria specification. But uh, it's important that the rule makes sure that the more potentially complicated cases are catered for. This is uh, one. The other one uh, granted by member state. Okay, there are some options discretion granted by member states which are uh, uh, fixed term, so they expire. Some others are permanent. So the ones that they expire when they come to the expiration date will have to be renewed and that will be the ECB based on this package to, you know, to sort of phase in the new regime. The other ones, the, if, if they are permanent, then uh, we'll have to look into them. And of course, we are in contact with the national authorities to identify those specific cases when the package will be in force. Uh, 
we will make the necessary changes. Maybe on, on the first part, um, I, I couldn't agree more with, with Ignazio. Just to reiterate one point, that of course uh, we are only prudential supervisor. We also need to consider the resolution strategy, right, which drives then the level of integration within the group. But like Ignazio said before, this is really a guide. Then the JST will, uh, will consider this uh, you know, specification in light of the business model of the bank, in light of the resolution strategy. So uh, the starting point, f as far as I am concerned, can only be really a, a very prudent credit risk um, management and consider the intergroup exposure like it were for a third party. And then it will be adjusted accordingly based on the specific situation of the group. Can you give uh, this uh, gentleman here with the glasses in front the, the, the microphone, please? Yes, good morning, Dominic Adler from the Association of German Banks. I have two questions on, on the waivers. The first one is on the liquidity waiver. In the CRR, it says that the liquidity waiver can be exempting in full or in part all re uh, requirements of uh, the liquidity regulation. And you interpret it that way that it's not valid for the reporting requirement. And I would take it that in full means in full. Um, that would be the first question. The second one is on waivers in general, even though so far I'm not aware of any waivers you granted for liquidity. But still, um, <coughs> I take it because it's not in the regulation and rather in the guide that old waivers that are granted as of now stay in force until further notice and have not to be applied for on the, on the 20 days after the publication. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, concerning the reporting, I don't know if uh, Giuseppe wants to take we, we For us, reporting is... Uh, look, we are moving, as I said, a little bit into uncharted territory. We want to open up. But we want to have the right information. So particularly in cases in which we have a more open attitude, I think it's important for us to have the information. So that's why we did not accept the logic that if there is no requirement, there's no information. Uh, you know, we, we want to see what's going on. That's basically the, the rationale. In terms of waivers, I think your question was similar to the previous one, namely when uh, as I said, if the, if the waiver granted by the national authority expires, then at expiration will be uh, treated according to the new package. If it is permanent, we'll have to be looked into. It's not that after the 20 days automatically <laughs> it expires. We'll have to be looked into and then have to be replaced by another decision. And, uh, I'm sorry. and again, on the reporting, uh, uh, indeed, there is this uh, policy trade-off between being more open and being prudent and conservative. But then, in the end, our expectation is that banks would have the in data anyway, right? Because we assume and we hope that banks track record of the intra-group exposures, even though there is a, the regulatory waivers. The regulatory waivers is something that might build up on some, on a, on internal reporting system. So. I think that it's really part of the normal practice, I'm not saying best practice, but the normal internal risk management to track record of the intra-group intra exposures. So I think that this is really, again, we didn't think that this would create uh, such an additional burden for banks. My suggestion would be if there are waivers that are in place, granted previously, now there is a new regime, that the banks speak to the JSTs, you know, and, and find together the most reasonable solution to each specific situation. Thomas, yeah. yeah. Well, one, one final argument for, for, for the reporting. Uh, liquidity coverage ratio is a new requirement introduced in October uh, 15. Mm -hmm. It's a new requirement for, 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 for the banks, but it's also a new requirement for us as a supervisor. So, of course, it is important that we, we can monitor this uh, for, for, for a period also. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Can you give her, please, the microphone? Jacqueline Mills from the Association for Financial Markets in Europe. Um, I have a question about the, the future. Um, so you've done a tremendous job of going from about 150 uh, options and discretions um, to, uh, to having just 30 or so that still need some further work. 
Um, but how do you see things going forward as uh, either new level two or level one texts are produced and hopefully there will be less discretion and options um, introduced into those texts, but there probably will need to be uh, some amount. Um, how do you see um, yourselves tackling this? Will you have regular consultations? Will you update the regulations and the guides? Important point. Uh, first thing I want to say is that uh, you may have seen in one of the sections of the guide that some of the ONDs are pending. Uh, there is more work to be done. And so there will be a second train, so to speak, or a second installment of this, uh, much smaller than this one. Uh, let me add, <coughs> we're not going to do another revolution anytime soon. But uh, next year, we will look into this very small number of uh, quite significant in terms of substance that we couldn't conclude now, and maybe, maybe a few others, but not. Uh, more. And that will be the end of it for the moment. There will not be every year a new <laughs> option discretion exercise. Now, your second question is, I think, more important. If there are new level two regulation, if the regulation itself changes, uh, what's going to happen? Now, what we have seen, perhaps uh, surprisingly, but not so much, is that as the European banking regulation becomes more directly applicable, for example, going from the directive to the CRR, to the regulator, which is directly applicable, the number of options of discretion increases, does not decrease, because the element of flexibility that is no longer there because of the transposition takes the form of uh, optionalities. Okay, so if this is a trend, I don't know, but if this is a trend in European legislation, I would expect that the legislator, unless they take into account the existence of the SSM, but the legislation looks at Europe as a whole, not... <laughs> And uh, this is a sensitive issue. Uh, unless that happens, I would expect that there will be other options, uh, discretion in the future. So we have to look into that. But now I, I think that uh, we would we have bigger shoulders because we have you know trained ourselves in looking and treating in a consistent way these provisions. So I I, I would anticipate, I would hope that the next steps will be easier. Maybe if I can also complement on this. Uh, uh, we are indeed trying to reduce the number of discretion, and also, and also in Basel, we have already started to do that. And uh, like Ignazio said, uh, it's uh, very likely that uh, when you discuss the level one tax and you follow the, the debate in Brussels, it's very likely that uh, also in order to strike the compromise, also in order to keep some flexibility, then the end result is indeed to have an initial discretion. So, of course, uh, we just uh, we cannot determine the final decision by the European institution uh, in Brussels that are responsible for legal one text. But for sure, I think that uh, this experience has uh, helped us to uh, detect national discretion and option because uh, we also looked a lot for an official definition of national discretion, and we didn't find it. There is only, only one definition by DBA. So, and then it's quite tricky when you have uh, a legal text uh, that uh, looks like initial discretion or, and it's not, or maybe it's a, a, type, a different type of initial discretion. So for sure we will try to ensure that the initial discretion text is clear enough uh, to, to describe what the competent authority might do and what cannot do, because this is, would help our, our work a lot based on, on experience developed so far. Let me take the opportunity to thank AFMI for the stimulus and the support that we received from them in a number of occasions, not, not only this one. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Hedy Ben Mahmoud from uh, Bank of New York Mellon. So maybe I'll start with, uh, I, would, I would like to come back on the large exposure regime. And I'll start with a real little remark, maybe, maybe before asking you a small procedural question. But um, I hear what you say in uh, in in saying that you have a, you are mandated basically to bring a level playing field, fully understood that, and in a prudent way, of course. And I hear also your remark, uh, Giuseppe, on the resolution uh, dri driving a lot of the decisions. That being said, <clears throat> and being a systemic bank, of course, but. I wonder to what extent you have factored in the very different business model that you have in your landscape, and especially very different businesses in nature. And if I'll take the example of Bank of New York Mellon, 
in Europe, it's pretty much a custody business and which has a risk profile fundamentally different from what you would have in your universal bank and the exposure are very different in nature. Coming back on the intra-group large exposure piece, uh, the regime uh, would put us and always puts us in a situation where basically by the cap that we have on that and the cash upstream we can have to the mother company pushes us of course to develop some some uh, items in our balance sheet like investment portfolio which are quite remote actually from our core business and which we don't view necessarily as a decrease of risk from our perspective given that we have to manage all sorts of risk that we don't do usually like interest rate risk of the banking book or things like that because we are capped by the uh, the amount of cash we can upstream to the uh, to the mother company so that's that's just one remark so two questions one which has been asked already but i'm not sure i understood the response or is the on the national discretion on the intra-group exposure regime there is one discretion apply for example in belgium where we are based for europe uh, what do they become and maybe it was said but sorry i missed it and second for these aspects of intra-group large exposure and these particular business model and implications there is a menu of criteria of course that you have proposed in term for exemption of this uh, would that menu work as a automatic mechanical menu and uh, with the, who is our partner for that? Do we partner for this t with this team or do we interface with the GST? The first is a complex question. Maybe I will ask some support from Chiara because here we are talking about national uh, discretion. So the discretion that are exercised by the member state. Okay, now the member state, now in some cases the discretion is explicitly Member state or competent authority. So the member state enters and they exercise. In other cases, they are not, and maybe some member states intervene with their own legislation, just in a sort of kind of a free way. Uh, in both cases, there is an issue of consistency with the well functioning of the banking union uh, and uh, the maintenance of. Um, uh, high-level supervisory standards, uh, and in some cases uh, there can be uh, there can be an issue there. And we mentioned this in our publication. I think also here we mentioned that there is a, an opinion, a legal opinion of the ECB recently that goes very explicitly into that. So, but of course the law is the law; it's not something for the competent authority. So. Uh, we have talked to the Commission, we are talking to the Commission, and they are sensitive to this issue, and I think they, in the follow, we are now uh, doing a little bit of collection of relevant cases for this, uh, in order for the Commission to be able to consider and act, and I think they will do something to ensure the well-functioning of the banking union. I don't know if you want to... Maybe just to add very briefly, we are again in uncharted territory, in the sense that it's the first time ever that a European institution needs to apply national law, and then there are uh, differences in national law, plus what can happen is that the implementation of this directive can also intervene at different times, different stages, and the question that is new but is very, very important for the future is whether uh, the member states are completely free in, to go in all directions when they implement, or whether, because this law is now the one that needs to be applied at the European level within the higher objective of having a more harmonized uh, single banking, actually, uh, union, um, they would be able to do that within certain constraints, in particular not to contradict the higher objective, not to go in all directions, but rather to go towards uh, further harmonization in order to allow the ECB to actually fulfill its mandate. It's new, it was never in court, this type of issue, and uh, it is something indeed that we're discussing with the Commission. Ellen, you have anything to add? Yes, <coughs> if I may add a brief point uh, on this issue. This discretion of the ECB is it's the fact that it can waive in full or in part this part of CRR. This national discretion comes under this part of CRR. Therefore, we understand that we can also uh, disregard this national discretion on the basis of this power of the ECB to waive on in full or in part. Maybe on yeah. 
yes, on, on the second on, one. On the second one, uh, the answer is uh, yes, we have tried to consider all the different business models. I, I know a little bit your situation also because we are in contact with the non-European authorities as part of our ongoing contact. So I am fully aware personally of the specificities of your business model. So, uh, but of course, uh, it's difficult to uh, factor all the different business models. And then, uh, like Ignazio uh, has said at the beginning, this is really a set of criteria that need to be adjusted to, on a case-by-case -case basis. And then the JST is responsible to assess that. So also to answer your last sub-question, who is your counterparty? So we are, you know, the supervisory board has developed a proposal for a guide that will be used by the JST. So this does not affect at all the normal ongoing interaction between JST and, uh, and the bank. So the JST, of course, will consult with us, with the team that has coordinated the work. But in the end, the JST will be responsible for the proposal based on, on the actual specificity of your business model. Uh, on the question of uh, insurance holdings, uh, there is in one of the paper a mention that uh, there, will, there is a, an appropriate requirement, uh, disclosure review. Uh, as you know, uh, banks uh, who are uh, conglomerates are requested through uh, CRR to publish the conglomerate uh, ratio. So my question is, uh, can you confirm that any analysis or change will go through the EC conglomerate directive of 2002? Thank you. You're correct that there is, uh, there is in Article 49, uh, Para 5, there is a requirement there for the FICO uh, disclosure. Uh, what we are looking in, uh, together with the European Authority, whether it is possible to, to supplement this in the Pillar 2 uh, guidelines, which will be developed by, by the EBA. And, and the details of that we Pillar have not... Uh, Pillar three, in Pillar 3, sorry. Uh, we have not finalized the details of this. Uh, but uh, again, I think that... Uh, uh, the, we, as we said, we are very much in close coordination with EBA, and I think that, uh, as you know, the EBA is also planning to review the, the Pillar 3 package. So we are confident that we can uh, uh, implement the supervisory board proposal to have uh, this enhanced disclosure. And I can also tell you that, of course, this was also part of the discussion in Basel, where you know, even though maybe the banks were not required to uh, to calculate or to deduct, sorry, to deduct uh, the insurance holding, there was some discussion in order to enhance the disclosure, so at least to help the market to assess the impact of any different treatment. So this is really, again, part of the level playing field that you, maybe you were asking for before, so just to the, for the market to understand what would the capital ratio be in case an alternative treatment would be applied. This is a case in which we are not complying with Basel. And one of the few cases in which, regretfully, yeah. we, we are not able to fix in yeah. this package. Yeah. We remain non-compliant. Yeah. Materi materially non-compliant. Materially non-compliant, <laughs> although we, we know, we, this, this disclosure thing, I think, is quite meaningful. Mm. Anyway. I, I see here's somebody who hasn't asked a question yet, so then we come to the gentleman who Thank you very much. Um, it's Michael Lever from um, Association for Financial Markets in Europe. It, it's a general question, really. When I look at the regulation, it makes it very clear that in carrying out um, the ECB carrying out its, super ta its supervisory task, it should have full regard to diversity, credit institutions, their size and business models, as well as the systemic benefits uh, of diversity in the banking uh, industry of the union. When I look through the regulation, when I look through the guide, there is only sort of limited areas that one can see where uh, regard is being had to these factors. So my question is, how do you actually ensure on the ground consistency of implementation having regard to these particular factors? Because it doesn't really appear to be much guidance uh, either within the regulation or within the guide itself to... Um, give one confidence that uh, the ECB will, as a practical matter, be able to take these factors into account in, um, 
implementing it, its rules and options and, and national discretions. I don't know. I, I think I can try a qualitative answer here. Uh, mindful of business model, diversity of business models, and the systemic benefit for the sector as a whole. This is what you... And my impression, maybe I'm too optimistic, my impression we are doing the benefit of the sector as a whole once we are clarifying how all this jungle of provisions will uh, uh, consistently be applied in the SSM. It's a big step in that direction. So I assume that simplification, prudence, uh, openness, and all the things that we've already mentioned go precisely in the direction of benefiting the sector. That's, that's my... Maybe I'm too... If you, access the, if, you, if you access the EBA website and look at how all the, mem all the national company authorities have applied these uh, 122 uh, national discretion, you will find very interesting uh, fragmentation, I would say. So we hope that this is really quite significant contribution to the simplification and to the level playing field of, uh, in which the, the banking sector uh, has been asked to operate. So... I think that uh, it's quite a, a significant achievement. Also, when we, we went to Basel uh, to introduce this, I think that it was very much appreciated. We went to DBA, even though we were together. So I think that we, we always receive a very positive outcome that we are working in the very right direction. Then it goes without saying that we need to improve, we need to, you know, some people might not agree with the each and every policy proposal, but that's part, really, of, of, of the process. But I think that... Uh, I personally believe that we are really going in, into the right direction. I think, sorry, can I, just, can I just come back sure. on that? Sure. Can I just come back on that briefly, please? Uh, uh, I absolutely agree that a huge amount of work has been done and is in the process of being done to um, ensure um, consistent treatment amongst the, uh, of the various different options and national discretions. What I'm asking is slightly different. When you get to apply this on the, on the ground and you're looking at different banks and different business models, how do you ensure between um, those different banks and different business models that you apply the option and discretion uh, equally to those and that when the joint supervisory teams have to go out and apply them, there is no particular guidance in either the guide or the regulation on the implementation of the application of the option discretion, taking account of the differences in business model or diversity of the institutions that are involved. So yeah, it's a slightly, di yeah. it's slightly different question, really. Yeah, no, I'm not, sorry, I didn't get that properly. But I think that this is really nothing new for this SM, right? This is what we do on a daily basis, in particular in DG4. So I think that, uh, as I said, we already have this uh, type of coordination as we speak, that the JSTs contact the coordination team and then DG4. But uh, the implementation of supervisory standards in an harmonized way is really one of the key functions of the SSM. And within the SSM is indeed part of the mission of DG4. So we have uh, many tools already in place that try to ensure consistency. So I don't think that there was uh, any need to put that in a guide or in a regulation, because it's really part of our core mission. Let me say that this is a much more pervasive issue than in uh, only relation to options discretion. This, is, this goes to how you ensure at the same time uh, consistent treatment of all the JSTs, even in the operational modalities of the JSTs, at the same time adaptation to the specific situation of specific banks and business models. There is a natural trade-off there. You have to find the right point in that trade-off. I just, just wanted to add, uh, this is, of course, uh, one of the main obligations of the ECB as an institution, equal treatment. When you decide, you need to treat the counterparties equally, and this needs to be done in consideration of their differences. Uh, so it is a, a continuous exercise, as, as my colleagues are saying, and uh, if anything, this type of guide actually goes in the right direction because it at least establishes a number of criteria that are committing the ECB, committing the JST, and harmonizing further the way in which they operate. The application of the specificities, of course, come on top, but it is anyway a step in the very right direction, I would say. The quality of treatment, other things being equal, but what is equal and what is not? Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, Jens Müller Meerbach, ING Dieber. Um, I would like to use the opportunity to come back again on 24.2 or 
page 38 of the guide, and uh, in connection with the question raised before, um, uh, my, my first question or, or um, um, asking is, could you elaborate on the timeline? So you state that you intend to um, develop a, a policy on making um, of on exercising 24/2 after um, having um, assessed the impact. Uh, connected with that, will you also choose the transparency that you used here? So will you publish a guide on how to use 24/2 um, and connected to that? also connected with the discussion on equal treatment until you have finalized the um, policy on 24-2. Will the JSTs um, uh, make use of 24-2 or will they not? And uh, my second question on this is just to have a common understanding. Um, exercising 24-2 on certain assets, as you mentioned before, would mean applying I4S uh, on this certain asset for FINREP, CORREP, S encumbrance, solo reporting, group reporting, pillar one, pillar two, pillar three. So everything connected with regulatory calculations reporting. I don't want to preempt the work of this little group that is now, but let's, let's not bring this out of proportion. We, we want to, first of all, it may in the end come up that we decide not to exercise this thing. If it either is not very material or it's too difficult to do. If we do something, uh, we will make sure that it is simple enough and feasible enough for everybody to be able to do it. And in the, that context, I would expect indeed that there may be a little guide, you know, methodologies, etc., that makes absolutely crystal clear and feasible for everybody. What we get now from the banks, that there's one category of banks that uh, have problems, and we are looking into that. It's not a majority. Most of them are just giving the data no problem. And so, you know, we, we see what we can do. Uh, on, maybe if I can answer yes, it, Nacho, yeah, on, on the second question, what happens until the, the option has been exercised? I understood that was your second question. Well, well, my clear understanding is that, that the option would be exercised according to, 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 to the situation before the ECB. So, for example, this is the case in certain member states. For example, Italy has exercised uh, this option. So they, they will still be in place until we exercise or decide uh, on this. Yeah, Jürgen Hillen again, Deutsche Börse Group. Uh, I have three small uh, issues also on the guideline. First one is with regards to the documentation related to Article 7.1, where you require the signature of the CEO in two different uh, subtopics. The concept of CEO is not common throughout Europe, so possibly you should take out this wording and uh, just ask for a competent uh, signature of members of the executive board. The second um, item goes uh, further down where you talk about liquidity provisions and uh, you have a provision there in saying, it's three times mentioned in different uh, cases, the national uh, liquidity requirements are in place, the credit institution should at least have an LCR for a year. We do not understand the link between the national regulation and the LCR, so the sense of this provision is unclear to us. The third element is with regards to the subcommittees of the supervisory board. You require dedicated to split the uh, boards uh, in an audit and the risk committee uh, if certain conditions are fulfilled. Unfortunately, according to national law, the size of a supervisory board may consist of only three members and the minimum size of each committee may be three members as well, as is the case for Germany. So, in just applying, uh, if all the criteria would fulfill, that means that we would have to have three meetings, one for the whole uh, supervisory board, one for an audit committee, and one for the risk committee with exactly the same members. So you potentially should put in open clauses with regards to the size of the supervisory board according to national law. Thanks for that. Thanks again for these very important, specific points that maybe uh, you know went out of our net, but but still they need to be taken into account. I'm not sure now that it comes to your third point. Uh, please write them down again if you can, if you have time. Uh, 
uh, whether when we say different committees, there's a good reason to have different committees, but what about if the committee is made up of the same people? Uh, that's an issue that we need to, we need to look into. I, I would still think that the different committees have different mandates, different accountability and different roles, so even if the people, there is an institutional aspect and there's a personal aspect, so I, I don't know. Is there a legal, uh, something legal that helps no, us in, here? In, indeed, indeed, there are two different issues, no. uh, and I take the example, for example, of the SSM regulation, where the governing council is in the end taking the decision under an objection procedure, but only in a separate meeting. The people are the same, but we completely separate the two functions because of uh, a different type of accountability, for example. So you could say, well, the identity of the people might not be ideal, but in some situation where, for example, there are only three members, at least the separation of physical times and agendas and procedures is already a, a better solution than to uh, meddle everything. So I would still see the advantage of having the institutional separation, if not the personal separation. But we need to look into that. But we honestly. look, of course. I, I think yeah, we yeah, need of to course. look into this issue. Any comment on the spot on the other two points, or we just look at it? Yeah, I, I'm what is documentation, the identification of the CEO, which is not typical in all situations? Yeah, I think that we, we can look at that again. I think that uh, but what we wanted to capture with the CEO was uh, a specific function. If this is not uh, good enough, we will look at that again. Mm -hmm. So if you have a concrete suggestion, we will look. And the, is the and, and, and the second is, is the national liquidity requirements in place already. Uh, there is a possibility to, to have that in the phasing in period of, of, of the NCR, and this is why we, we, uh, we tackle this also in the requirements. Uh, Sorry, say, say it again if you can. The, the, the requirement is if there is a national uh, thing in place, you can continue to have this until 2018. Agreed. There's also the requirement to report the LCR since 1st of January 2014. So what is the sense in saying if there is a national thing in place, you have to have at least the LCR for one year. We don't get the sense of this link of the two we, of course, agree that there may be a national thing and that we have to report. That's not the point. But what is the purpose of linking the two and requiring, if there is national one, then you have to have the LCR for one year? And what is then the consequence? It's unclear what the purpose of this concrete combination is. Um, I, I, I think we, we need to look further into this, but, 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 but for certain, the national liquidity requirements might not remind of, of, of the LCR here. And the first paragraph of this says that you need to have the LCR in, in, in place for one year, but, but we will look into this. But thanks. Hello? Yeah, sorry. Uh, Bertrand Rossini from uh, French Banking Federation. Uh, a quick question to, uh, to put into perspective the um, uh, if next year uh, the TILAC uh, is transposed within the uh, EU legislation and if, and we hope so, that uh, given that uh, we have a single um, supervision uh, area in Europe and we have from the 1st of Jan 2016, the, a single resolution uh, area as well. Uh, so if this uh, TILAC um, term sheet is transposed uh, within the EU law, would you then reconsider um, the treatment for, for instance, intra um, cross-border uh, liquidity waiver and uh, as well as large exposure intra-group, uh, given that then we would strengthen uh, definitely the, 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 the too big to fail, uh, the, the issue of the too big to fail banks, and in order to avoid liquidity and capital fragmentation, uh, we would align then, um, uh, let's say, supervision uh, regulation uh, within, with, with the, let's say, the uh, EU TILAC legislation. If I understand correctly, if I understand correctly, the, are we prepared to review what we are saying now in light of the fact that the, we will have TILAC MRL regulation in place, single supervision, single regulation, almost complete but not fully complete banking union, etc. Et 
We, in the, the guide, we plan for a review of the liquidity minimum in 2018, if I remember correctly. That's the plan. And formally speaking, we are not prevented from reviewing this, uh, particularly the guide, the guide that uh, does not need to be consulted in principle, so minor adjustment can be made. We can do it at any time. But I mean, just to give a little bit more certainty on the time frame, we said that in 2018 we will look into this. Yeah, um, of course, we cannot predict when this will be transposed into the EU law, but for sure we already put also a reference to the resolution strategy that, if I may, is even more relevant than the transposition of TILAC. Even the TILAC will, uh, will require some adjustment within the crisis management group, right? So, it, and again, I think it very much depends on the bank specificity of the resolution strategy approved by the crisis management and the resolution authorities, because you might have the case where you not, do not have a single point of entry resolution strategy. So in the end, if there is no single point of entry resolution strategy, it would be quite difficult or counterintuitive to allow full uh, movement of liquidity and capital within the group. So again, we, we, we already have the placeholder. We already have uh, intellectually and a prudential perspective uh, the reference to the resolution strategy. And I think that uh, the JST will already be able uh, to accommodate that. Last but not least, we are already working with a single resolution board. We are looking at specific situations. So I think it is really part of the ongoing work. Um, I'm referring to uh, Article 11 of the regulation where you propose um, a 5% outflow rate for trade finance um, exposure. Could you elaborate on the basis for this calibration? Really, the, the calibration uh, of, uh, of, the, you know, of something that has already been agreed, we try really to have uh, you know, this, the same uh, preferential treatment uh, and also not to avoid any disruption for this quite important uh, business. Yeah. Yes. Why zero? Why zero? Well, normally, <laughs> let me tell you, normally we, yeah. we've tried to consider the specificity of trade finance. Yeah. Uh, there are a number of points where this pops up. Uh, because the, we, we are aware, I've been in that sector myself in one of my past incarnations, and uh, um, it's a very competitive market. Uh, uh, we compete with Asians, we compete with Americans in this area, et cetera, et cetera. We try to be still prudent, but uh, relatively open. In this case, we have this 5%. Uh, maybe we have way okay. Yeah, well, uh, uh, th 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 there's also an EBA report on, on liquidity. Uh, as you know, I, I must admit, I don't remember the exact details of this, but I'm certain we looked into how the e EBA report looked in, in, in this regard also. Let's uh, look again. Yeah, we can look again. Okay. Thanks a lot. Perhaps we, we continue over there because uh, that was the next hand. Uh, I know that uh, in one of the previous questions, uh, this this issue has been spoke, but uh, I think not exactly in, the, in this way. Uh, regarding the the guidelines and the decisions already already at the existing decisions, uh, if they are not temporary and they are permanent. Uh, as the guideline established a series of, of criteria and a series of, of, of necessary documentation for the decisions, are the already taken decisions going to be revisited according with the guideline? Do you have this in mind? Or this guideline is forward looking and it does not affect to the already uh, decided? No, I, I think I've already mentioned that there, there are two types of revisions to be made. One relates to the 
decisions that we are already making now. We are already using this in order to assess waivers that we receive by the day. Uh, so, but these, of course, decisions are not uh, definitive necessarily because this is not yet approved. So we put uh, provisions in all of these waiver decisions, put a little provision that you can see that says that uh, within 12 months it may be reconsidered in light of the final, the definitive version. That's one thing. The other one is, I think, the one that we have already discussed earlier, is the case in which the national authorities have made a certain decision on what we do. And there, again, we have two possibilities. One, whether it is permanent or it's expiring or not. If it does not expire, then we will have to have this dialogue that we mentioned between the JST and the bank and find the right way to uh, treat uh, this eventually in a way that is consistent with the uh, provision. Uh, for the liquidity, uh, sorry, Dominic Adler, German Banking Association. Uh, for the liquidity waiver on national level, you are asking for a SREP score of at least two. Um, I think using a SREP score is kind of difficult because I've never seen such a letter, but I take that uh, the banks do not know the liquidity score, so they don't know if they fulfill these requirements before they apply for the waiver. So my question would be, uh, will banks have well, can banks ask the ECB what their liquidity SREP score is before they apply for the waiver? Or they apply for the waiver and they said yes no, or no. We, we, we will look again at that, yeah. at that specific part of, the, of, the, of our publication. Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a useful point. Thanks a lot. La first and last. Mr. Lugarese from Banking Federation. Um, well, first of all, um, my understanding of this issue of the existing waivers, let's see if we, if we share the, 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 the understanding, is that according to the SSM regulation, Article, I think, 150, the decision taken by the authority remain in place. Of course, this doesn't prevent uh, changes uh, also with due respect, in this case even more uh, uh, forceful of the legitimate expectations. Then one question is regarding um, two um, ONDs that uh, uh, are not um, addressed in your draft document and they regard Article 113, Paragraph 6, the, um, the possibility of, of zero risk weight on uh, infragroup um, uh, holdings uh, and also uh, regarding uh, the uh, delegated uh, regulation on LCR, the Article uh, 33. Um, I understand that there will be a second package. Uh, Mr. Angeloni mentioned it, but if you can say something more on these two, maybe it would be useful. I think the first point, uh, uh, I think technically you are right, so the national decision remains in place until further notice. And I would not consider that an expectation is legitimate to expect that uh, the further notice will never come. Uh, it may come, uh, but you are right that there is no solution of continuity, so to speak. So we go on and then we reconsider. On the uh, Risk weight, the zero risk weights. Uh, uh, we are looking into these things. There is an intra-group uh, dimension to it. There is an IPS dimension to it. There are different things in Article 113, and that's part of the additional uh, review that we are making. Uh, I don't know if you want to add something on this one. So it will come. <clears throat> so that was indeed the last question. Good. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming and for participating. Um, that leaves me only to wish you uh, safe travels home, you and your families, uh, a happy holiday season. And um, 
perhaps see you next time for the second train.